Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ONC 2022 Tech Forum breakout session, Developing Clinical Decision Support with SDOH Data for Improved Patient Outcomes. My name is Brandon Smith with Kaufman & Associates, and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To provide comments or ask questions, please open the chat box, which is located towards the bottom part of your screen. Click on the talk bubble icon, and this will pull up the chat box to the right side of your Zoom interface. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located at the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will allow you to see the speakers as they present or share information. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type the issue into the chat box and I will respond to you as quickly as possible. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded. The session recordings will be available on the Tech Forum platform within a few days. The recording will be available to view on demand for one year. The slide deck shared in this session will also be available on the Tech Forum platform within the next few weeks. Finally, closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. With that, I will now turn it over to Joanna. Great, thank you, Brandon. My name is Joanna Henry and I serve as an analyst for ONC and I am joined by my colleague, Allison Kemp. We have been partners in crime now for a few years in the CDS space, and we are glad that you all have joined us for another ONC session to share and discuss clinical decision support. This go around, we are looking to dig a little deeper into clinical decision support and health equity and SDOH data. ONC is operating within a health equity by design approach, which means we look for the opportunity to include equity in all of our work. This includes exploring how SDOH data can be used to help identify and eliminate health disparities and to improve health outcomes at an individual and population level. In this session, we seek to understand how we can use clinical decision support to advance the use of social determinants for more person-centered care. CDS is based on clinical practice guidelines that provide evidence-based recommendations for care decisions across many fields and support targeted recommendations at the point of care that can help to improve health outcomes. Work in the space of health equity and clinical decision support is not new to ONC as it is our mission to create systemic improvements in health and care through the access exchange and use of data. I will now pass the mic to Allison to share highlights from our previous work, starting with some of our workshops. Thank you, Joanna. At our 2020 CDS workshop, we discussed the current status of CDS in relation to the National Academy of Medicine report, optimizing strategies for clinical decision support and where we would be 10 years after its publication. Our 2021 workshop, Clinical Decision Support for Advancing Person-Centered Care and Health Equity included presentations on federal implementation updates, industry advancements and implications for CDS and the path towards equity, and we engaged the audience and subject matter experts to rate progress toward completing the goals from the 2016 CDS NAM report. Now Joanna will talk about SDOH CDS feasibility. Great, thank you. Recently, ONC explored the feasibility of utilizing standardized CDS to advance health equity, the status of relevant standards, and the HL7 specified process for translating guideline recommendations with social determinants of health factors into standardized CDS. The result was an analysis and compilation of a sampling of specialty practice guidelines with SDOH components for pediatrics, cardiovascular health, and substance use disorders. An update on the status of standardized CDS, particularly for the HL7 CDS hooks specification. And lastly, drafted examples of the HL7 FIRE clinical guidelines implementation guide process for selecting guideline recommendations for clinical decision support implementation. The, pre the presentation was shared during this year's annual meeting and I'll provide that link in the chat. Today, we will learn and discuss ways to advance electronic clinical decision support, focused on social determinants of health and health equity throughout the different stages of electronic guideline development and implementation. Next, we will hear from Dr. Kristen Miller from MedStar Health Research Institute and Dr. Mike Gillum from Health Lab, who will present an example of CDS that could incorporate SDOH. Good afternoon. 
I'm Krista Miller. I'm the scientific director of the MedStar Health National Center for Human Factors and Healthcare. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Mike Gillum, the CEO of Health Lab. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Today, we'll be sharing work that we accomplished as part of an ONC LEAP 2020 award, a project that we call Fire Factories, and discussing its application and natural extension as an equity engine to develop CDS that incorporates social determinants of health. Next slide. Our ONC LEAP 2020 award was the Area 2 Cutting Edge Health IT Tools for Scaling Health Research. Healthcare faces a rising wave of exponentially increasing data, with reports indicating that healthcare data is doubling every 18 months. And there's lots of challenges in using that data and capitalizing on its value. Our project specifically focused on open source health IT tools that can be used by researchers, but also for clinical operations. And while lots of tools exist, it's difficult to know what tools are available to you, where they exist, what the purpose is of their use. Uh, some of them struggle with usability and usefulness, and not all of them adhere to open use standards. The ONC policy and development agenda identified the need to develop tools and functions that leverage health IT infrastructure to support uh, better support research. Next slide. Our methods are pretty simple, but our, uh, our objectives were simple, but our methods were robust. So we started first by conducting a landscape analysis. We wanted to identify what tools were available for biomedical and healthcare delivery research. Once we identified tools, we evaluated those to uh, determine critical needs. And we use those findings to support the development of our health IT tool using uh, our Fire Factory platform, which Dr. Gillum will, will demo shortly. We developed two use cases and we evaluated the oper operational utility of those solutions. Next slide. I wanted to highlight some of the work that's been done over the past two years. So starting with the landscape analysis, we conducted a scoping review to identify open source open standards tool. Uh, and we identified 121 tools that met our inclusion criteria. We evaluated these tools and found that generally they had high levels of usability, uh, but there were some challenges, challenges in accessing the tools. Uh, some of them required dependencies or advanced programming languages. And so that helped us to inform our future solutions. We also interviewed stakeholders and we worked with an expert steering committee with representatives of EHR vendors, health IT policy experts, clinicians, uh, digital health experts, and also patient advocates. And some of the findings were discrepancies in the definition of open source, challenges in adoption and promotion, the importance of community support for open source tools, a lack of sufficient incentives, and the need for tools to support data maintenance. So we looked at tools across the data lifecycle from extraction to transformation to archival and maintenance uh, was was the place where it was most lacking. We then conducted a horizon scan. Uh, so if the first part of our project was what is current state and what tools are available, this next phase was what do we imagine the future will look like? And so we evaluated tools that may be early in their development uh, or the request for tools. And they fell into three main categories, interoperability and data security, data types and public health data. Next slide, please. More specifically, this was the comprehensive list of critical needs. Uh, and I won't go through all of these, but you'll see a pretty broad range uh, based on our analysis. So general uh, requests, the need to support innovation in health IT research. And so um, more funding opportunities like ONC offers that allows developers to create open source tools. Uh, lots of conversations about technical challenges, a lack of incentives and governance. Uh, and then a handful of challenges I don't think that we anticipated. So workforce challenges, even if we're able to develop really important tools, say for a public health department, would they be able to then staff and leverage those tools? Um, challenges with fire capabilities and, and Dr. Gillum will get into that more specifically, but um, our ability to pull data in the way that we had anticipated, thinking about things like bulk fire and CDS hooks and lots of other um, exciting opportunities that, that we hope we're able to take advantage of in the future. Next slide. What we were able to build, um, which you'll see shortly, is our Fire, factory, fire Factories infrastructure. Uh, conceptually, the data factory leverages uh, fire data at scale and for analysis. And this is a whole new way that we're thinking about data and how we're able to ingest it and transform it. 
and we'll show you two different demonstration cases. One that we're calling bugs and drugs, it's an antibiogram engine. And so being able to understand at the point of care, which medication to prescribe um, using antibiograms. And then the second is a trend engine, which could be applied to any number uh, of things that you wanna trend. Different outcomes, um, different monitoring. And so really exciting opportunities for us to leverage both of these different infrastructures. Next slide. And so we'll, we'll show you what we built now, but I think what we're really excited about is how we can leverage this in the future. Uh, the digital divide has been identified as the newest social determinant of health. And so while there are technical uh, solutions and we're thinking about extending the fire factories beyond just EHR data. So if right now we're focused on clinical data, how might we be able to incorporate patient-generated health data, patient-reported outcomes, um, thinking about wearables and social determinant surrogates. And so while we think we have a good technical solution, there's lots of other considerations that we need to explore. Uh, no matter how great the solution is, if patients um, don't have access to the internet, if there's um, inequitable access to devices or a lack of trust among communities, it doesn't matter how great that solution is, we won't have enough users to make any uh, make the program valuable. Uh, and so now I'll turn it over to Dr. Mike Gillum. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and we'll show you the fire factories and the two specific demonstration cases uh, that we're really excited to share. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so let me share my screen here. <clears throat> Excellent. So to continue that thread, I want to just begin with a, with a story. Um, and it, it's 1908, and you might recall Henry Ford begins producing his first cars, but his first cars are built using a station build approach. Five people stand around and they build the car from the bottom all the way up to the top. But as the cars roll off the line, the quality varies tremendously. Some teams are great, some teams aren't so good. And if you bought a car, you had to hope you got one of the good teams. Um, or your driving experience could not be so good. It wasn't until five years later uh, that the first use of the Ford moving chassis assembly line was created. And after that, this is what led to a whole variety of increased productivity and quality. It took a sixth of the time now to make the cars. It cost a seventh of the cost to make them. And they were able to scale up 120X. And, uh, and we looked at that and it, if you look at research itself and knowledge creation and then impact and driving that, there's a variety of challenges. One of the great challenges of research is that it's often a one-off. It's a manual process. It's something that someone does at a workstation. It's a custom crafted process, almost like cars were before the assembly line. And yet, if you try to automate research using the tools and technology used in healthcare operations, tools like Tableau and other sort of KPI tools, you rapidly discover that you can't write a medical article simply using something like Tableau. The traditional statistical tools that we use to prove knowledge in medicine just aren't, aren't part of it. And the result is, is that there has always been this large chasm between operations in research, it's as if you publish something, uh, it, it's as dead as the paper that it's printed on. And the question becomes, how do you bridge this chasm between these two worlds? How might research be automated so that it can have a continuous operational impact? Our thought was just like the assembly lines of today, how could we leverage automation to promote and scale research and knowledge discovery? And towards that end, we propose Fire Factories as an approach for testing and demonstrating an open source stack of technologies and standards for automating knowledge discovery at scale. And the idea was that we would demonstrate how you could take an existing medical article, identify all the parts in the medical article where data science was done. In this case, there are 72 different areas. Turn each of those 72 different items into effectively computer programs and turn it into this, what we were calling a data factory. This is an assembly line that recreates all the data science in the article. And this was the factory part of the grant. The second part was to pull data from a medical record system via fire. And, uh, and I won't go deep into how this was done, apart to say that it has been a long challenge how to get data at scale from electronic medical record systems via fire. And, uh, and what we discovered and described uh, in, the, in the course of this grant was an approach which we called the birthday query, where you could march through all the dates and times. And this can be leveraged to pull data, uh, population level data at scale across 
in using fire. And the result is that we're able to demonstrate a closed loop learning healthcare system where effectively, uh, just to summarize you, you find a best in class article, you turn that article into a data factory, then data is pulled from the hospital uh, via fire from a hospital EMR into that data factory. It's processed and transformed. That fire factory generates a academic article now that is customized to that particular hospital. The knowledge is generated from that particular localized location. And then the data factory generates not just a human readable article, but it creates a machine readable article as well. And, uh, uh, and then the result is, is that that can then be enable you to take that knowledge and embed it in a smart on fire app into the EMR, for example, to become part of the clinician's uh, data workflow or, or daily, sorry, daily workflow. Um, and, uh, and the result is, is that something like a fire app or a CDS hook can access that living article and present those results. So the res recommendations are always up to date. Um, and this effectively it, it demonstrates a closed loop knowledge system, or in some ways it's close to the vision that IOM, the Institute of Medicine expressed 14 years ago of a learning healthcare system. And here's an example. On the left is an, a medical article generated with all the p-values, everything you see in blue and black and the charts and the graphs were, gem, dem, were created by the data factory uh, that you see on the right. And one of the powers of this particular approach is, is that as the data refreshes, the, the medical article effectively can be uh, recreated. And, uh, and this creates a bunch of new opportunities that we haven't, haven't had um, before in healthcare. So for example, research is often a one-off manual process. It takes a long time. And now research could be run over and over again. The article can be regenerated on a cadence as the data lake refreshes, the article can be rerun and updated. And now it meant that you could track how your interventions are doing. If you're tracking something in terms of like inequity, you can try an intervention, rerun your article, how has inequity improved? The, in effect, the result is a living article. Tradi traditionally, as I mentioned, articles can be as dead as the paper on which they're printed. Now articles can be living, always up to date. Uh, you may have heard the quote attributed to Peter Drucker, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Um, in this way, you effectively, you, you build an article, um, you run it, you note the baseline, new data flows into the electronic medical record, you run the article again, rinse, wash, and repeat. Um, and, uh, and now you get this sort of high quality publication grade knowledge that is continuously developed. The next thing is, is because the data is pulled via fire and the analysis is automated, the fire factory is reusable. It means every hospital can have a modular reusable component that they plug in, it pulls the data in a standard way over fire, and it becomes customized local research driving operations, creating a, a bridge. Also, because the knowledge creation engine is computer code, it means it can be cloned and it can be tweaked to create new classes of knowledge. Once you build one factory, it makes the next factory easier to build as well. And so we, we found that we could tweak, for example, the trend engine so that the trend engine could look at trends in lots of different conditions and diseases, just running that same factory over and over again. Um, and as uh, Kristen mentioned, we built two examples of these fire factories. One was the trend engine, which looked at trends over time. The second was the anti-biogram engine. So let me just jump in briefly and show you what that what that looks like. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen larger now. And for those of you who have not, these are open source tools that we built upon. For those of you who have not seen Apache uh, Airflow, which is an open source orchestration tool for orchestrating complex workflows. And this is often used in data pipelines. But now what we've done is taken these data pipelines and created little workers that are now creating knowledge in healthcare. And you can see uh, that you can essentially scroll and see every step of the different workers that are transforming that, that knowledge. And then there's little buttons for running these things and you can set these things to run on a cadence so you can have your medical article run every day or regenerate itself every week or every, every month. And then there's a variety of different tools inside here to track 
the progress of when these workers run. And you'll notice these there's different status markers across the top. And as they run, they will change color. And uh, and then the ultimate the ultimate what they generate is effectively uh, the data that goes into some of these articles that we were just showing. And this is what the code looks like on the back end. Not to get too not to be try to be too, too intimidating about it, but this is the DAG. This is the directed acyclic graph. This is what we we've open sourced this this code so that other uh, researchers can take this code and use this in their own uh, trend engines um, using Apache Airflow. And the result is, is that it generates the data like you see here. Um, in this particular case, this was looking at the trends of opiate overdoses. Um, and everything that you see again in blue and black was generated by the computer. Um, all these graphs, this is the hourly trend uh, of, of uh, opiate overdoses, you notice that they don't occur so much in the middle of the night, um, uh, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., but more during the evenings. Um, this is the day of the week patterns. Notice they occur more on Fridays and, and Saturdays. Um, the monthly pattern, they occur less in the winters, more in the, in the summers, and then also um, the yearly pattern. And notice that we could see Looking at the trend, we could see the spike uh, around 2013, 2014, and 2016 of the opiate epidemic. And this is the, the trend engine effectively uh, demonstrating that, picking up that particular trend. Um, so, <clears throat> so just to keep going, the, the, uh, the thought is, is that there's an opportunity here to extract data and measure equitable care in an evidence-based peer-reviewed way that there, there's an opportunity for these, these approach to be applied to what we were calling equity engines, where you feed drivers of change directly into the workflow of clinical care, where these tools become shareable, reusable, and modifiable. The concept is you build the knowledge, and then the question is, how did we do? And then what can we do? The build the knowledge piece is the data factory. How did we do is the article that's that's generated. And then the what can we do is the embedding of a fire app or a decision alert that pops up in the medical record system. And uh, and just to give two examples of that, think about access to care is, is a, a real problem or access to follow-up care. And imagine if as a patient is seen in the emergency department, you get the social vulnerability index score or, they were, or they're about to be discharged from the hospital is probably a better example. And you see the social vulnerability index score and it's it's correlated to a high risk of not having follow-up occur, that they, these are patients that, for whatever reason, they have difficulty obtaining care. Suddenly, the alert pops up and says, click here to add a social work consult before discharge. Well, now that social work consult occurs, and now on the back end, the data factory looks at this and analyzes over the next month or two months. It just reruns. How are we doing in terms of ensuring access to follow-up care? Or think about food instability. You can't fix your diabetes if access to right foods, like food from grocery stores is impossible. This is another part of the social vulnerability index is food instability, poor access to grocery stores correlated to readmissions. Or imagine if an article is written to look at that correlated to readmissions or multiple visits for di diabetics. Now what happens if a patient's at risk? The you know alert pops up. This patient's at high risk. Um, click here to add a nutrition consult, and then what does the data factory do? It reruns that analysis month after month. Are we doing better at closing the loop, decreasing the admissions, improving hemoglobin A1Cs? Um, so at the core, that was the fire factory approach. We hope that it can help, and uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thanks. and pass it on to the next speaker. Hi, great. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Next, we will have a presentation uh, from CDC followed by a demonstration um, project. Thank you. So Mona, that's you if you're on mute.
Brandon, I think everyone's trying to unmute and can't. Mona, you should be on now. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am gonna be speaking about um, cervical cancer and how we can improve physician uh, adherence to following the current cancer screening and management or clinician. Um, given that cervical cancer is really a disease of inequity that really could be eliminated, um, I am gonna speak with my colleague, Rose Alamante, um, who's a nurse informaticist, and I'm a medical officer from the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. I've been working a lot on improving guidelines, but really, if we can work systematically to improve these complex guidelines where it's a default, um, then it would improve uh, screening and management. Next, please. So some of the... Um, background on this is that uh, the World Health Organization has asked uh, that cervical cancer be eliminate, eliminated worldwide. There's a big initiative, and the Department of Health and Human Services has committed to this effort to nearly eliminate cervical cancer through both vaccination of HPV vaccine and screening and, and following up with those that have an abnormal result. And specifically, trying to focus on those with equitable access um, to ensure that everybody has equitable access through at-home screening, uh, mobile screening, and also to get back on track after many of the missed cancer screenings that occurred during the pandemic. Next. Uh, cervical cancer, as you may or may not know, there's approximately 14, 12 to uh, 13,000 new cases every year with 4,000 deaths. Um, and we shouldn't forget about the 200,000 cases of high-grade precancers that are identified during the screening and management process. But what's really important, even here now in the United States, is that 60% of these cancers are occurring among women who are never or rarely screened. And of those women that have cancer and had an abnormal test result, they don't often receive an adequate follow-up. Uh, the inequities for cervical cancer exist in you know, the high incidence of cervical cancer among Hispanic and Black population, the higher mortality, vaccination rates being uh, differential, screening and treatment also uh, are differential by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, rural, urban, and immigrant status. <clears throat> Also, there are inequities in where screening and treatment is managed. Um, there's often insufficient staff and resources to, to update EHRs and ITs, um, adopting newer guidelines or slower. And then there's also, also challenging in accessing specialty care, um, especially in rural populations. So all in all, it's really cervical cancer is really preventable. And if we can focus a little bit on improving screening and follow-up, to reduce the precancers and ultimately reduce the um, burden. Next. I think, uh, yes. Um, and this, this particular um, clinical decision support tool that we're going to be talking about um, was mentioned um, in the president's cancer panel report where we're talking about how to align and improve cancer screening. There was a specific call out to create health information technology that promotes appropriate cancer risk uh, assessment and screening. So if you get a chance, please take a look at that. Next. These um, tools that we're creating are not creating of new guidelines, but they're really adapting existing guidelines in a clinical uh, format for the clinical health, electronic health record. So they're taking advantage of the US Preventive Services Task Force for average risk population screening, and that's um, linked with the Affordable Care Act. They're also taking care of uh, advantage of the existing um, ASCCP guidelines, which are the only guidelines out there on how to manage an abnormal screening result, like an HPV and PAP. But, but what's new about those 2019 guidelines is that they've become so complex but they're no longer in a paper format. You need an algorithm where you're getting the history of the past history as well as the current history. And often times those, that information can be available in the electronic health record. Currently the way clinicians are operating this is they're using a separate independent app and typing in the results that may already be in the electronic health record. 
And we are also taking advantage of existing screening guidelines for cervical cancer for some of the immunosuppressed population and HIV population, which really doesn't exist in terms of uh, having a clinical decision tool support for that. Next. So this project goal is to basically improve uh, outcomes through the, you know, through um, uh, implementation of sort of complex guidelines. So we're hoping that we're going to improve uh, clinical adoption of these guidelines, improve ultimate patient outcomes. And the health equity angle is that we're hoping to develop these tools that are open sourced and feasible to implement in some of these low resource settings and that provide care for underserved populations that often don't get access to this. Next. So the conceptual workflow of this is that in the middle is where the clinical decision support software tool would reside. It has an engine that takes advantage of existing structured elements that are needed from the electronic health record. And then it follows some of the um, rules repository and the evidence-based guidelines. And then it uh, uh, gives a message to the clinicians about what are the actions um, that one should use for both testing and screening and treatment and care. And then there's also the opportunity, which is our, one of our next steps, is to uh, create a message uh, that would be appropriate for um, the patient portal, especially when it comes to management. There is nothing like that. Thank you. Next, I mean. So this is a uh, prototype uh, notional uh, depiction of what it would look like with the clinical facing dashboard. And so you see here that um, there's a patient, uh, it leverages existing um, EHR components to query and filter the patient record. You can see the relevant medical history um, in terms of the biopsies. And there is that opportunity to add condition, add procedures, and add medications in case it's not in the EHR. And then you can see what a clinician would like to see in terms of all the past HPV and PAP test results. And then it gives you the risk estimates uh, in terms of what, is, what the risk estimate is for developing a, a precancerous lesion and then what to do, whether to uh, whether to keep on um, seeing the patient, doing the treatment, like a LEAP procedure, et cetera. And um, it also allows, um, and it uses a fire interoperability standards. Next, please. So the first, one of the things we did after we developed synthetic data was to actually uh, pilot this in a real life setting. And the pilot partners that we picked we gave great attention to make sure that they were being piloted in an underserved setting um, or across electronic health record vendors. So the first one is the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, it's currently just starting. And um, one of the highlights of this, of course, is Mississippi um, has one of the highest rates of cervical cancer in the United States. They have a, a good research um, group that's conducting research on cervical cancer. So there's a lot of engagement and then they have an EPIC that um, also extends to the Mississippi Department of Health. So we can see how it works in, um, in the EPIC central group as well as through Community Connects. University, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is the next uh, pilot site. And the advantage of this one is um, they have a strong partnership with the lab that produces discrete pathology results, which is one of the most important things here to make sure that follow-up is appropriate. and. Um, because often what we get is PDF or, um, formats of pathology specimens, and what this particular tool would benefit from is discrete pathology results that are um, standardized across all settings. The, the Pittsburgh Medical Center also has um, many rural clinics and works with other primary healthcare doctors, and they also are taking advantage of a uh, PAP tracker uh, that uh, comes from EPIC. So we're able to sort of coordinate that CDS tool with the PAP, PAP tracker. And then the last one is Ventura County um, Healthcare Agency that uses Cerner, and they also have a focus on safety net clinics. Next, please. Uh, you can just show all the points. So uh, just this slide basically is talking about how important when we actually did the pilot site in Mississippi visit, it was at the beginning of the uh, the floods. And so you can imagine um, some of the SDOH variables that we're thinking would be captured here. 
um, specifically, we realize that the uh, the University of Mississippi does have access to the EPICS Compass Rose, but does not utilize it. And from the perspective of cervical cancer screening, it would be really important to know some of these social determinants of health in terms of why there is no follow-up. And specifically, as far as the guidelines are concerned, if there's any kind of variable that tells us where the patient is more or less likely to come back, it would allow the provider to maybe offer a, a more see and treat option for treating an abnormal result. <clears throat> Next, please. So there's critical uh, data gaps and challenges. Um, a key challenge to our efforts is uh, involving the interoperability of pathology data coming from the laboratory information systems. And then these particular management guidelines um, and supporting tools really require pathology results that are easily computable so the care recommendation can be generated for the patient. And the 21st century acts is a really good first start, but doesn't really enough do enough to address the interoperability between EHRs and laboratory information systems. Uh, there's also um, um, health equity barriers as well. So um, much of the data that comes from laboratory information systems that we need is not typically standardized or structured, uh, such as HPV test results, cytology results, and histology reports. But we also understand there's a similar uh, kind of initiative occurring through the College of American Pathology to standardize these in a synoptic format. Next. So when uh, we're conducting the pilot evaluation, some of the things that we're going to be looking at are if there's um, foundational queries to understand patient population. So some of the factors that we will examine besides the typical age, sex, race, ethnicity, insurance will also be other variables if they're available in the EHR, uh, such as safe housing, transportation, et cetera. Um, we'll also be looking at SDOH factors that we think might be critical to determine treatment or surveillance, specifically for cervical cancer, as if have they been screened before, are they more or less likely to come back for follow-up? And we are also assessing additional usability feedback from the clinicians to see what was missing what, how we could improve it and improve clinical workflow. Next. So the pilot is gonna be inducting in three clinical settings to test the feasibility under real world uh, conditions. And um, we do have, um, we're providing support to the clinicians, uh, informing and engaging the patient. We also um, want to let you know that we're gonna publish the CDS resources on the CDS Connect repository. A version already exists, but um, after the pilot, st st uh, pilot study, there might be more improvements that we will add. Next. One of the key things about this project, uh, it was supported by CDC, um, but I think we do need to consider like, uh, what is the adoption sustainability of this um, as guidelines evolve and are updated? Um, you know, what can we do? Uh, can we consider a public-private partnership? Is this something that really needs to belong with the medical organization um, to update? And do they have the uh, the bandwidth and the support to do that? Uh, leveraging partnerships with HRSA controlled networks is one of the um, one of the uh, collaborations we're looking forward to because we think again piloting in an underserved setting would be really important. Um, we are also looking to see how we can apply this framework to other cancers. Once we've created these modular tools, we do think that some of these things could easily be substituted for, let's say, colorectal cancer screening or breast cancer screening. And um, ultimately, we would like to uh, look at the clinical outcomes. What we're looking right now, our process outcomes, what we would really like to see is, did this actually improve and better cervical cancer screening and management? Next. I would now like to hand this over to uh, Rose Almonte, who will demonstrate the tool. Thank you, Mona. And I just want to confirm, can you all see my screen? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Rose. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll be spending the next few minutes demonstrating a, a notional representation of how the computable guideline might be presented to clinicians. As Mona shared, we took the existing uh, published uh, cervical cancer screening guidelines 
guidelines for immunocompromised individuals and management guidelines published by the ASCCP uh, to translate those following the, the four levels of knowledge representation. Um, and, and as Mona mentioned, the guidelines have become more complex, um, it, especially the management guidelines, which are more individualized and rely on an individual's current results as well as their past history. Um, and based on, based on those risk-based guidelines, an individual's management of abnormal results might involve a one-year, three-year, or five-year surveillance, which involves HPV-based testing, higher risk um, individuals might be managed with colposcopy or treatment. Um, fortunately, the ASCCP organization makes a web-based tool or mobile app available for clinicians to kind of manually input current results, past results, along with information like age and procedures to then present a recommendation for clinician. Um, but the next time the patient comes in, that same information needs to be re-entered. Re so, by building a computable guideline that can be integrated within an EHR, the data is already stored in the EHR and can be leveraged to help support clinicians. And that data then persists for the next time the patient uh, comes into the office. So this tool that I'm demonstrating is something that our technical colleagues develop to show how this tool might be uh, presented. Uh, this particular representation shows how it might be integrated within the EHR as a, a Smart on Fire app that might open in a separate window and display the dashboard that Mona uh, shared with you. Um, our pilot sites are also exploring how the tool might be more tightly integrated using CDS hooks. Um, but if you might recall from just a, 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 a personal kind of screening experience, uh, three main points where we think the tool might be most helpful might be it during some sort of pre-visit preparation step where uh, staff are reviewing patient charts and identifying any kinds of necessary screening or follow-up needs. Uh, it might be during the rooming process or patient assessment where the dashboard might be accessed to, to identify any needs. And, and, and lastly, and likely more importantly, is when screening results come back, the tool can be asked, accessed to display um, any screening or management recommendations. So this first sample patient, um, imagine I've logged into the EHR, I've selected my patient, uh, I'm doing a pre-visit preparation and uh, have clicked a button to view this patient's dashboard. And so now this, this dashboard appears, uh, and as Mona showed you, um, foundational to this CDS is the computable guideline that represents the screening and management guidelines. Uh, and in this dashboard, we're displaying some of that pertinent clinical information that's considered when making a screening uh, or management decision, some relevant medical history that might put them in a higher risk, any screening or management history, uh, and associated results. So that that clinical information is on the left side. And on the right side is where the CDS would have reasoned over this clinical information and is now displaying a, a, a recommendation for a clinician to consider. In this case, for this patient, I see that there was um, a, a co-testing performed. The individual is 42 years old. They had an HPV test and a cytology test performed in 2016. And based on this history, the um, CDS is displaying this recommendation that the patient is due now. Um, with co-testing, the recommended interval is every five years. Um, so given that the patient didn't have any screening after this point, it's displaying this recommendation to perform screening now, along with some, uh, some text um, for the clinician to understand some of the language from the guidelines. Um, we do also include just some language here to um, make sure that the clinician knows to review this information with the patient to make sure there aren't any gaps, any missing medical history or missing screening tests. We also display some action buttons here, and these are likely going to be uh, locally determined based on the types of procedures and the types of staff that might be accessing the dashboard. Um, 
So that is one example of how the, the, the dashboard might be accessed. And this second example is um, Mrs. Vale. Um, and uh, imagine, I, so I logged into the EHR, I have accessed Mrs. Vale's chart, who was here for a visit, and I am in the exam room with her now and reviewing this information with her, sharing that based on these guidelines, she is due now because I don't see any history of screening or management. She uh, remembers that she brought in a past result from um, uh, the lab that she received um, it, last year. So she had testing done last year. She came in with the documented results. Um, and then based on local policies and processes around manual entry of external results, there may be this capability, and we've added some of that capability in a variety of these areas where clinical information is um, relevant in determining next steps. So in this case, it's a 28-year-old indiv individual where cytology testing every three years is recommended. The results that she provided me show that she had a cytology test performed, and the results were nil, and that test was performed in March of 2021. And when I enter that information, the dashboard dynamically updates based on the underlying guidelines and uh, shows that the individual is actually up to date with her screening. Um, she is average, average risk as there's no evidence of um, any high risk conditions and she's due next uh, for screening in March of 2024. And then one uh, last example I wanted to show, um, and this uh, kind of speaks to the challenge that Mona described about the availability of discrete pathology results. Um, and this example is um, Ms. Flowers here. Um, and uh, Ms. Flowers, she had a colposcopy performed. And imagine I just received a lab result notification within my EHR. Um, and and I, I view this dashboard because I know that it was related to a, a colposcopy where I'm performing a biopsy. So I see that there's a histology test performed, but I don't see a discrete result. Uh, and some of you may have, have kind of looked at this dashboard and thought, well, well that, that's great that there are discrete results appearing there for these tests, but that's not usually the case. And what we've heard is, is that that is not usually the case. Um, and we are working with um, some parallel initiatives to improve that capture and sharing of discrete uh, pathology results. In the absence of that, what we've learned is that there, there are EHRs that offer um, uh, capabilities to capture discrete results to represent narrative types of reports. Um, so with, with actually with some of the pilot sites with Mississippi as an example, um, they, they are much further along in capturing discrete results uh, and having those discrete results stored in their EHRs for, for cervical uh, cancer screening. In this case with Ms. Flowers, the clinical information is on the left. I, I don't see a recommendation. And the CDS is withholding providing a recommendation because it recognizes that this histology re result is important in making a, a determination of what the next step should be. Um, and as in most electronic health records, uh, there, there would be the capability to, to click on a, a link to view that narrative report. Um, this tool is work in progress, so pretend when I click on this link that it is the narrative report of that biopsy that you're viewing. Uh, and in viewing that narrative report, I have this ability to edit it and uh, record a discrete result for that, um, for that report. Uh, and in reviewing the report, I determine that it's a histologic LCIL, a SIN1, um, and the date of the test uh, is retained there. I click submit. And based on the underlying guidelines, um, 
uh, the, the next step is to, to perform HPV test, HPV based testing one year after this uh, biopsy result. So essentially it's uh, HPV based testing due now. Along with language from the management guidelines to give the clinician more context as they may have a shared decision-making conversation with their patient. In addition, for those clinicians that may be interested in seeing um, more context, uh, as we mentioned, the management guidelines are risk-based and based on this history of results and um, current results and the past results for this particular individual, um, the, the CDS is also displaying some of those risk estimates for this current combination, but also the risk estimates of um, you know, if there were other combinations of results uh, that, that might have been presented. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Uh, I did want to point out that one of the benefits of the tool is that by integrating the guidelines, as Mona mentioned, the goal is to make the guidelines more accessible to clinicians. Over the course of translating these guidelines and speaking with pilot sites and other organizations, we've heard uh, a lot of anecdotal stories about unnecessary referrals. Um, and, you know, the presumption that if there's an HPV positive, that might be an immediate referral for a colposcopy um, where, you know, clinicians may not realize based on the, the updated management guidelines, those lower risk um, screening results may, may only need a, a surveillance HPV based test in one year, three year, or five years. So, um, you know, by having access to these guidelines integrated within your EHR, um, it, it may empower some of clinicians, particularly in low risk settings, to see that they may be able to manage um, those abnormal results locally with just a follow up HPV based testing in, um, you know, in, in one year, three year, or five years. So that is my last example. We welcome you to reach out if you'd like to learn more. I do also want to recognize the contributions of our larger CDC and MITRE team who've supported the project, along with the consultations with uh, expert advisors from the National Cancer Institute, as well as a, a group of expert advisors comprised of OBGYNs, primary care providers, pathologists, researchers, among others, who've helped support this work. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rose and Mona. Now our remaining panelists will introduce themselves. First, we have Dr. Doug Peterson from UConn Health. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm delighted to address ASCO's commitment to inclusiveness and health equity uh, in its guidelines. Uh, the guidelines from ASCO continue to be uh, at an ever-increasing pace and scope in their production. Um, just as, as background, ASCO has about 45,000 oncology members worldwide, uh, representing 151 countries, and approximately a third of our ASCO membership uh, are non-US and Canada. So it's a, it's a broad reach in oncology, um, and the guidelines, our centerpiece for publication is the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and that has an impact factor of a little over 44. So we put that all together, the broad worldwide reach and the impact factor of our uh, produced guidelines. And um, we see value in the guidelines in, in, uh, in cancer patient care. I'm gonna ask our audience just to kind of reset the frame here. Our previous speakers have done really a magnificent uh, uh, effort in explaining the technology side of this. What I'd like to talk about for a few minutes and then turn it over to my ASCO colleague, Dr. Scott Tagawa, is where ASCO stands at present with its guidelines and social determinants of health and potentially linking with CDS. So I'm gonna come at it from the expert content side and I'll ask you to think about how we could take the best of this and uh, really integrate it into some of the technology that we've heard about earlier this afternoon. So just to um, show you where we are with our guidelines, uh, I'm just going to briefly excerpt uh, some text, just briefly read it, uh, that's in integrated in, in very similar ways throughout all of the ASCO guidelines that we produce. So when we talk about best practices, our guidelines at ASCO are based on expert recommendations using high quality metrics for uh, evaluation of the strength of the literature. 
But we recognize that access to the guidelines and what the technology they represent varies across countries and healthcare systems. And there are a number of social determinants, including socioeconomic uh, status, uh, degree of health literacy, access to health inf healthcare information, interprofessional oncology protocols. Uh, these are just a few of the many. We've heard about several others this afternoon as well a few of the many uh, SDOHs that we build into our ASCO guidelines, guideline after guideline. Uh, we also talk about uh, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and limited access uh, to medical and uh, uh, overall healthcare in the United States. And we talk about the impact of that restricted access on um, obstacles to receiving care and reduced quality of life and cure outcomes. And all of, all of these metrics are also reinforced in our ASCO guidelines methodology manual, which is online. Um, and we talk again about the importance of addressing health disparities throughout our systematic reviews, including citing specific studies on social determinants of health and health equity uh, uh, in our guidelines. And so, and so I'm excited and, 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 and pleased with the structured framework that ASCO has relative to the uh, envisioning of the creation of a guideline, you know, the need for that guideline. I'm excited about the very uh, precise methodology that is followed across the guidelines. Um, I'll, I'll share with you that uh, this last year we had about 2,500 cumulative volunteers uh, in ASCO working on the guideline portfolio. So a lot of us give our, our time and effort as volunteers, which we're privileged to do, uh, related to guidelines, measures, and, and standards activity. This, so it's quite an impressive number of volunteers. Uh, this is not our full-time uh, employment. <laughs> and so having this structured framework for social determinants of health is absolutely critical. Now, having said all this, um, envisioning and creating and disseminating the ASCO guidelines is, is actually the easy part, I'll say. Um, delivering the contemporary and easily accessible guidelines to the busy clinician, and we touched on this in our previous talks, uh, can be very challenging. And embedding CDS into that modeling, uh, as important as it, exciting as that is, um, it represents a further strategic uh, time and cost intensive step. And so the discussion such as we're having this afternoon and Next Steps Beyond become very important to ASCO relative to how do we take the expert content and map it into the technology that we've been talking about. So I think as I begin to close here, uh, perhaps two ultimate questions for our consideration um, are number one, you know, if we're highly successful in relation to integrating CDS and social determinants of health um, into our EHRs, what is the actual, the actual measurable differences in patient care? And I might add, as well as health economic outcomes, is it more cost effective uh, by doing this? What are those measurable differences that are projected to occur if we're highly successful with this, this integrative model? And then importantly, and particularly with ASCO, I'll say, what technology, in, including some of the modeling we've heard today, uh, represent the best and most uniform approach to taking the, the science and its clinical translation and ASCO guidelines and embedding it into uh, CDS with an ever-increasing emphasis on social determinants of health. So as I close, uh, I'll just share two uh, takeaways, two bottom line uh, uh, messages, if I may. Uh, ASCO has taken a very broad approach to integrating social determinants of health into its guidelines. Um, we have our requirements through the methodology manual, and we have our statements in each of the guidelines. Um, the EHR opportunities, including CDS, are being modeled as well. We have a ways to go on that and uh, would welcome further discussion on the best way to do that. And if I had to pick one success of our ASCO guidelines over the years, and you know, as measured perhaps by the JCO impact factor of 44, um, we have we produce, in our view, high scientific and, and clinical quality with our guidelines that you know we we aim to change cancer care and improve uh, the management of patients either at risk for cancer or who have cancer. I think one of the biggest challenges facing ASCO and perhaps many others is uh, integrating the guidelines into the EHRs, including 
the clinical uh, decision support system uh, that embraces the social determinants of health. We have the text, we have the literature, we have the, the references, and how do we best translate that into clinical practice through an EHR? And, and the technology opportunities, uh, the cost to do that, uh, eliminating redundancy across systems uh, with other organizations so that we can all uniformly uh, be uh, uh, systematic in our approach are, are very important areas to address. So I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for uh, a few minutes of our thoughts and uh, I'll turn it back to Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Next, we will have Dr. Scott Tagawa from Wheel Cornell Medicine. Hi, I'm Scott Tagawa. Um, I'm a medical oncologist and um, focusing gen oncology at Wall Cornell. Um, I don't actually know if Doug said this. So I'm the immediate past chair of the Evans Space Medicine Committee, and Doug is the previous past chair, <laughs> and two years ago, the chair of the, well, when he was chair, it was the Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee that has now uh, merged with another committee in evidence based medicine. So that is um, our, the organization that we're representing today. Um, I'm going to speak in part as an unofficial representative of ASCA, but also um, touch on some of the, um, the things I heard and, and saw today. I didn't actually prepare a lot of specific information, um, but just kind of also level set, as, as Doug said. You know, guidelines, I would say, are to improve patient outcomes, and it's not to restrict things to make patient outcomes low across the board. It's to improve and elevate um, using evidence. Um, so just, I'm not going to give a talk about guideline methodology, but, you know, generally speaking, we will identify a topic, uh, prioritization by some experts, and then um, overview from overall ASCO to kind of um, figure out priorities, and then form a panel, create guidelines, um, and then publish and disseminate them. Most traditionally, at least for ASCO guidelines, and it's true, I think, for many of the different organization guidelines that are out there, it's, you know, a, a static publication that, you know, nowadays is not just going to library, a lot of people know what the library is, and, um, you know, looking up things and photocopying, but, you know, PDF formats, and now um, some formats are electronic. So, that has been um, an improvement and gives the opportunity to make changes, um, I think, more quickly. So I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll take over from what kind of Doug was um, alluding to. So uh, to give you some specific examples of where we're going, but also some, some places we've been and how this might um, uh, relate to clinical decision support um, that hopefully will also integrate social determinants of health. So we have uh, what some people call maximum um, uh, level guidelines uh, where there's resources available. And that we're usually thinking of countries or regions as we do that, um, but clearly not every place within actually where I live in my city is exactly the same, let alone states or throughout the country. Uh, but certainly there's entire countries that are um, different levels. Um, so stemming from, for instance, cervical cancer, what we just heard about, uh, mostly from screening. One of our most recent rapid updates um, was a resource stratified guideline for cervical cancer. Um, and it was rapid because this new antibody, I'm not going to get into details from oncology, but a new antibody that's an immune agent that can lead to some good outcomes for a subset of patients. But antibody also happens to be quite expensive, so that may not be available everywhere. So if available, do this. If not available, then do this. If not available, then do this. And that, I think, is an important aspect, um, because even within a country or within a city, not everything is going to be always available. Um, now, uh, even within our, without, outside of our specific research stratified guidelines, we will, as, as uh, Doug mentioned, um, will include language on um, disparities, um, kind of classic disparities, but also disparities in terms of having chronic conditions that may make something ineligible for a certain type of a treatment or, or a test, um, cost and value, gender inclusiveness, um, and then gaps in terms of, of research um, to kind of set the stage for the next level of, of guidelines. And where we would 
love to go, and I think we're getting much closer, is to be able to become more integrated into an EMR, such as the example that was just shown uh, for cervical cancer screening. One aspect that I saw of that, not to um, really criticize, but it looks like those are static guidelines that probably were based on data from some number of years ago. Um, could be one, could be 10. Uh, so one advantage uh, with um, technology and that we've just launched a pilot of was or is um, uh, ongoing living guidelines. So published today, let's say tomorrow, which is not literally tomorrow, but next month, searching literature, seeing what needs to be updated, searching next month, what needs to be updated and updating in real time. So not having just that publication, but in real time, it is there. Um, they're in electronic format, they're with algorith algorithms um, to make things more user friendly. That I think has the advantage of then being able to pair with an EMR. So in a certain situation, when someone has a certain disease or risk factors, then something will pop up based on the best level evidence today, or at least within the last couple of months, rather than something that is from a couple of years ago. So just getting guidelines implemented into EMRs is a huge step and we're not quite there yet. But at least, um, you know, we have some of these things that are going in parallel to have some of these living guidelines uh, able to be updated in real time that hopefully then would be able to be integrated into the EMR. So as we update this on this website, it's tagged to this EMR in terms of uh, decision support. And hopefully that is further integrated within the EMR that has elements of, you know, as we talked about for, you know, where they're living, do they have insurance, et cetera, um, to then populate, okay, in certain areas, this is what we really wanna do, but when follow-up is not available, then this next level is hopefully the detail that would be able to, to come out because I can tell you as a clinician, I don't necessarily have all the time to even do the updates that was that were shown in, uh, you know, the, to make a complex text document um, fall into categories for that decision support, for instance, for a cervical cancer. Um, so just to kind of uh, give you an example of some things that are ongoing and then, um, you know, I, I think there will be questions at the end when I see uh, some, uh, something in the, in the chat that I'll, I'll get to. Thanks so much, Scott. And now we will transition to our final presenter, Dr. Emily Weber from Indiana University Health. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, for the introduction and to the other panelists. I was, I'm was i sitting here doodling and, and, and just my, my pen flying across the page because the work you're all sharing is incredibly inspiring. And I feel like this, to tackle, um, to tackle equity and, and the already existing inequity in healthcare is, is a mighty task. And so I can think of no route better suited to do this. Um, I am, a, as, as Allison mentioned, I'm Emily Weber. I practice here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I practice at a children's hospital and a pediatrician for inpatient care. I also serve as the chief medical information officer here at the children's hospital and uh, co-CMIO for IU Health. We're the largest provider here in our state. And so we have everything ranging from uh, clinics to partner care hospitals and critical access. And in listening to everyone sharing here, I, I was um, thinking the examples of thinking about social determinants and how they relate to clinical decision support. Um, it feels like it's it's the must do element, and so um, I am I, I feel like my introduction is a series of disclaimers that I don't have a single solution um, of how it works. But I I'm so inspired by by this becoming not an afterthought, but kind of an integral part of how we design these tools facing forward. There is an element in the chat, which I will let one of the other folks also address, but it was talking about um, the biases that are some of what we're talking about may inherently have as well. And I think that's an incredibly important point. Um, our guidelines are based on data sets and we all know all data sets are inherently um, and contain inherent bias by virtue of of what they're, they're based on. What I do see it differently, and in my clinical work, I have medical students and residents, and I'm sure a lot of all of you have that experience as well. I hear them asking that now, 
Whereas when I was in training, we didn't we didn't necessarily question that as much as I think there's a higher level, I guess, of literacy in our clinicians now about inherent bias in even the, the guidelines and algorithms we look at, and therefore an inherent responsibility to include and measure that, especially before you translate it into this um, some of our high powered tools <laughs> excuse me, um, like the fire APIs that were mentioned previously, as well as just even scaling something within your EMR that's going to touch thousands of patients, um, I think is incredibly important. <laughs> excuse me, sorry. I tested yesterday. It is not COVID. It is just the lovely Indiana um, change of the seasons, I think, um, reminding me that that I have allergies as well. Um, one thing I just wanted to, to mention as kind of an example leading lead, as part of my introduction as well is that um, in our topics today, we're talking about identifying and eliminating those health equities. And to be very honest, I think one thing that we at IU Health and our counterparts have found is that um, things that we, I think we used to think were sort of static in terms of demographics and demographic data <coughs> do contain some of those elements that are so critical to social determinants and also the associated inequities. And um, as an example, one thing we're doing is we're looking at even just our building blocks of um, race, ethnicity, and language data and ensuring that we're doing a better practice and a better job of validating in that with our patients versus pulling it from somewhere and then building on that. Because what we find is we're missing whole swaths of patients in our communities and our system because we, because of, of, of some very basic element, we're missing kind of risk groups. And then that gets, um, we see that later as we measure things like our own alignment to things like hypercholesterolemia or blood pressure or hypertension. Um, so in some ways, it's a little bit of a back to basics element. The flip of that, so identify and detect, and then the flip of that is acting on it. And in some ways, applying the clinical knowledge it feels like the easier step in some ways. I think a lot of our hope in clinical decision support tools and, and what we found valuable, excuse me, is ensuring that we, we really do make the best use of the things in our EMR. And then what we're starting to layer within my health system are, um, are smarter tools on top of that to tell us the things we don't capture. So the things we have, we wanna make sure are optimized. And then when we're bringing things in from other sources like payers and then sources we don't even predict are gonna be our partners in this, um, that becomes a richer layer and a richer context so that we can act at the patient level and then at the community, the clinic level, and then the larger community level. Um, because I actually think we're pretty strong on patient-directed CDS in a lot of cases. What we're not great on doing is finding um, clinics and communities that, that are following in certain trends and, and using our influence in that way. And so I, I'm looking forward to the rest of our discussion because I think we're gonna get into a little bit of that. So thank you so much for the chance to participate. Great, thank you so much um, everyone just for your presentations, um, for your introductions and Emily, um, just because everyone might not know, I think one of the things that we mentioned is our one of our previous uh, workshops that we did on clinical decision support and um, at least for the first one that I did, I know you were present for that. So we appreciate the continuity in being in uh, one of the earlier uh, workshops and then continuing um, support of our work and engagement um, as we have this session. Uh, we do have limited time, but we're going to continue on with some kind of prepared questions that we have for our panelists. So I ask that all of our presenters and panelists that as you do see some questions in the chat, please feel free to respond to those. Um, Allison is also going to drop our email addresses um, in the chat so that if we don't get to something, um, you can email us so that we can follow up. So I'll kick us off uh, with our discussion. Uh, one of the first questions that we get um, that we had discussed in preparing is, why should we collect SEOH data if providers can't act on it? So one of the things that we have been doing at ONC, um, because we recognize again the gaps, is really taking that SDOH data and standardizing it. And the reason um, for that standardization is so it can be used. Um, so we're saying we've, we've done our part in um, putting SDOH data, health equity data in the US CDI um, and supporting the efforts to get that data into the US core implementation guide. Um, and it is for use. Uh, the work that we've done, that feasibility 
uh, work was looking at the opportunity to take uh, SEOH data information from the guidelines and turn that into electronic clinical decision support. So we're looking at the options for that. Um, and that's kind of why we're here today. Um, one of the things that we discussed is kind of knowing all of that is uh, what we probably want to find out is where is the right time and place to collect um, that SDOH data. Um, and so I'm going to pause right there uh, to, to let you all respond. Emily, I see you're shaking your head. And I think this I was, well, I was actually typing a response to a question in the chat about how we might be using um, CDS and as social determinants kind of in some intervention. So I'm happy to give an example of that. And maybe that can speak to the timing. Um, I was uh, responding to the question and I was going to uh, give the example of food security um, and food. In, so food security, food insecurity, where is my next meal coming from is actually, it, it may be asked a lot more in pediatrics perhaps, but I just like to, there are no ped specific problems. We just describe them really well in pediatrics, perhaps, because it's actually relevant to all kinds of patients. I think that's a good example because you can look at zip codes and predict food deserts, or you can look at income or home, uh, home uh, status as also a predictor of food security. But what we found very helpful is that a very quick screener, and there are several that are validated, we've tried I, I'm just going to share, I see there's many people on the call, so I'll assume everyone has good intent and we won't use this against me, that we've made lots of mistakes and tried it. we tried it lots of different ways where we're like, maybe we can do it universally at a well visit. And that didn't work so well because we had other priorities during that time. There are two places where it's worked very, very well. Um, and I'll give you two examples are um, patients that are actually preparing to be treated for, and these are adult patients, preparing to be treated for their cancer or oncology process. And the reason that worked is that as we were making their care plan, if we asked that right up front, we could actually direct and connect them with resources that improve their outcomes instead of nutrition being something that we had to address when they were maybe very ill, but addressing it up uh, at the point um, of maximum influence, which is like, oh, great, I'll just program maximum influence into my CTS tool. It is different depending on the intervention you hope to match it with. But food security, um, I would just say that we did not find it um, helpful to ask universally. We found it helpful to ask when we knew we needed to address the nutrition at a certain point in time, like the oncology example. Um, we also ask it um, specifically for some children with chronic renal disease. And those were populations that we found um, were, were, since it was also encompassed in their medical plan, it made a lot of sense. So that's just one example. Um, and my, my day job as CMIO, I think universal asking for SDOHs is actually not terribly effective because um, again, the timing of when you wanna intervene on it, also your patient wants to know why you're asking um, and it, that builds into the trust. So it was perhaps a longer answer than I intended, but it's a great question, so. Another just to follow up on that on that comment, um, <clears throat> when should we when should we capture that data? Um, and I would one one approach is um, as early, minimally, and passively as possible. Um, and just to tell a story, uh, so some years ago, you you might recall the SARS epidemic, and so we had a little pop up that we added to the emergency department uh, for the nurses, and the and the pop up was to screen patients to say, hey, you know, have you traveled overseas recently? And if you did, they were at higher risk for SARS. And, uh, and you know, you might recall that the mortality rate was very high for, for healthcare and, you know, workers. And so we, we rolled that out, and this was in the midst of triage, and, uh, and we checked to see how many of the 4,000 visits uh, the nurses had added and answered this additional question on top of the vital signs and all that. And you might wonder, you know, the risk is very high, how engaged were the nurses on those visits? How many did they fill out after that, that, that month of these 4,000 patients? And the answer was 13 patients. So for 13 patients, the nurses had answered that question. So then we looked what the, what the type of patients, like maybe they only asked that question to the sickest, most you know, severe patients. And it turns out that one of them was an ankle sprain. Uh, another one uh, was, uh, none of, there, were, there were very few that had coughs or even shortness of breath. Uh, one of them was they were thrown out of a bar by a bouncer. Now, maybe they walked into a bar and said, I've got SARS, and then they got kicked out, and that's what they, but the point is, is that they were low-risk patients, and yet this life-saving piece of data, potentially for the nurse themselves, 
that, that was too much activation energy. And so our takeaway from that was when it comes to patients and patients entering data and collecting that data, we need to make it early, minimal, passive as possible. In fact, you want to catch it from the data exhaust, if you can, just the normal things that patients are doing, just collect the data. Um, so we talked about breadcrumbing, just little breadcrumbs, just try to make it as easy as possible to capture as much as possible, but over time. Um, so that's just one, one thought on the principles for capturing that data. Thank you. For I guess I'd like Okay, oh, yeah. go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, no, just add one more thing because I think Emily sort of nailed it on the head earlier about the actionableness of this. And I think that's part of like, I see Janice's comment, which I appreciate. Folks are frustrated because nothing's being done. And I think we're not supporting clinicians in knowing what to do. And there's levels and, and nuances and complexities, but there's certainly the clear this person needs a consult, right? Or a social worker might be able to help them or some of these like big picture impacts. And then I think there's like clinical decision support specific things that I have not seen fully explored. So for example, if I was looking at cardiovascular risk of a patient and I'm thinking about whether or not we should prescribe them a statin and I find out they don't have access to a pharmacy, that's gonna change perhaps whether or not you provide a medication, right? Or I think there's like decisions at the point of care that may be influenced. Um, or if you notice that they're a diabetic and you didn't realize that they have food insecurity or, or that sort of thing. And so I haven't seen guidelines that incorporate SDOH in the same way that we think about if then clinical medicine, like if sepsis give antibiotics, right? I haven't seen if this social determinant then that um, and I think that's why there is frustration, even on the clinician side, where they're saying, like, I, I just don't want to know. And I don't think that they mean that. They mean, like, I'm so busy and I have so much to do and I don't know what to do about it. And and now I feel helpless in the same way that the patients might feel helpless, too. Allison's going to get me. Um, one of the things that I do want to add, um, in addition to uh, the, the work that we've been doing with feasibility, we're also doing work um, with that SDOH data, looking at screeners, looking at opportunities um, for uh, referrals, so closed loop referrals. So I think to your point, our hope is that we can act on there's something that you can do to help send out that referral. Um, so it's not that you're just getting this data and seeing it. So more information to come. I'm going to let Allison ask her question, um, and then we'll probably just come back with one closing uh, question. So I wanted to ask one of the questions from the chat, um, which was, how do you vet real-time guidelines? Do they have enough science behind them? What about biases or other issues from algorithms used to cull the necessary data behind them? N knowing the fire factories projects and how those can be generating like instant guidelines and Scott was talking about also real time and wondering how close to real time the guidelines in the cervical cancer tool were. I just thought that reached into so many parts of what everyone presented here today that um, that hopefully um, we can get some answers from all of you to that question. Yeah. I'd love to take a first first swing at that. Uh, I think this is this is exactly at the core of why we thought um, healthcare needs a factory piece. Meaning <clears throat> there's lots of healthcare efforts that are using KPIs and dashboards and these sort of things. And yet we have a standard process for creating knowledge in healthcare today, um, which is the medical article. And these medical articles are written to create things like clinical guidelines. So imagine if the, if the medical article that was used to create a particular clinical guideline, it's been peer reviewed, it's statistically reviewed, there's a particular methodology by which that data has been transferred into knowledge. And if you computationally instantiate that, that becomes the method by which you try to ensure that the knowledge that's being created from the data is the best it can be. And one of the nice things is once those data factories are built, you can, you always discover mistakes. You always, right, there's this huge reproducibility error and, and problem in healthcare. You always discover mistakes, but now they're a computational entity that the whole world can descend on and keep making better and better and better so that the clinical guidelines that are being uh, established can be, are more, more trusted. Um, so, so building on top of the shoulders of giants, building on top of the articles that are already there that have been peer reviewed, start there as a baseline and then build forward. 
Yeah, and if I just may um, add to that, and uh, uh, Scott had mentioned from the ASCO standpoint, the living guideline concept, and that's not unique to ASCO, but we've worked very uh, uh, diligently to move that forward in a, in a strategic way. And then um, as I'm listening to the discussion, I'm thinking as ASCO continues its commitment to uh, health equity and inclusivity um, across our guidelines, we have targeted cancer therapies we could have targeted social determinants of health metrics as well. And I think it ties back to what Emily was saying and, and so forth. And so I, I guess I would just ask a question, even though I'm a panelist to, to Mike and to Kristen, perhaps uh, the fire technology could, and maybe it's already there, it could be customized for precision social determinants of health. You know, the breadcrumb approach, but the right breadcrumbs. Is that is that a fair way to look at it? Absolutely, I think so, yeah. So that I think is a uh, powerful opportunity, uh, one more connection with uh, clinical decision support uh, to customize our social determinants of health metrics. So, yeah. Um, I was gonna, yes, I was gonna add that for the cervical cancer guidelines, we've uh, partnered with the actual authors of the, of the guidelines. So we are um, you know, talking to um, the new version of the ASCCP guidelines and, and basically you know, the guidelines are on a risk-based algorithm. So if a new technology comes in, the same action is going to be uh, recommended. So it, the whole thing is to just sort of incorporate that new technology, uh, you know, whether it's um, an, a better HPV test, et cetera. So um, I think that that's important to always be discussing the guidelines as we're developing the clinical decision support tools. And the guidelines that we're currently talking about are evidence-based. And similarly, we've talked and updated, talked to the task force as, as well. So I think because of the modular way that the, um, the tool is formatted, you can easily substitute, for example, for screening, if somebody wants to imp implement the American Cancer Society screening guidelines versus the USPSTF, they can easily change some of the, and we can actually specify where they can change that. So I think that it's important to start from the very beginning. And another important point that I didn't make earlier was having clinical quality measures, um, you know, that are, uh, you know, we, we've, we know about the clinical quality measures that exist for screening for can some of the cancer screening, but there's nothing for follow-up. And so if we can create something that, uh, that talks about the most abnormal results and whether they're followed up, then we can sort of talk about measures on the continuum. Uh, and and they should be a, 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 you should be able to get them from the electronic health record rather than the way currently they are, which is administrative data. All right, thank you. Sorry, Allison. Emily, if you can just go really quickly in one minute um, so that we can wrap up. <laughs> Please go to the please go to the wrap up. I just was saying the chat is also lighting up, and I could talk to these these other brilliant panelists for for hours about setting up this taxonomy and how you really start to say social determinants of health. Like, it, it, they're not all created equal. That's all I was mm -hmm. going to say, and and I think that this rigor that we're describing, we're going to have to use different tools to demonstrate that rigor and in, in the future. So. Great, I appreciate you for sharing that. I think that's what I was thinking too. I was like, man, this is a great group and we're gonna have to get everyone together again to continue this discussion. I don't know what that looks like, making no promises. Uh, but a couple of things I do wanna leave you all uh, with. One of the questions that we had, we had so many questions that we didn't have the opportunity to uh, to get to. Um, so as, as a closing, and you can put it into the chat, who should lead the way to advance the fields um, and what kind of partnerships will it take to make it happen? What is the role of government, tech providers, payers, industry, health systems, et cetera, um, to pull all this together to make it happen? Um, again, that's that focus on SDOH um, and clinical decision support. Um, so if you can put your responses in the chat, that goes for our attendees as well. Uh, we have heard about several opportunities and the challenges for CDS with the focus on SDOH and health equity. So our hope is what we have is that we have sparked your minds to continue thinking of ways to use structured standardized SDOH, SDOH and health equity data uh, for CDS at the delivery system level um, and beyond. Also keep in mind that as you develop and use the different tools, there's still a need to assess uh, uh, that CDS usage and efficacy, if interventions are used, if recommendations are accepted, and if they trigger appropriately um, 
in that development phase. Uh, we thank you all again. Um, the last thing that we want to make a note of is that there are CDS technical informational information resources and forums to continue this dialogue among our stakeholders. It was mentioned before, um, there are a lot of resources um, at CDS Connect. Um, so we'll drop that link uh, into the chat. Again, thank you all um, for attending the session and all of the engagement. And I do hope that we can get together and continue this conversation. Brandon, it's your turn. <laughs> thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you everyone for joining today for this wonderful session. The next plenary sessions start at 4 p.m. Eastern time and can be accessed through the ONC Tech Forum platform under sessions. With that, we conclude today's session. Have a wonderful afternoon. Great. Thank you all. <laughs> Brennan, I think you can cut it. <laughs> you made me nervous. So now I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.